All right, so this is chapter seven here, um, flexibility training. So uh, we will not be going over this in class, but we will be taking care of this, you know, through this video presentation so that you can see what I'm talking about, so you can kind of have a better understanding of everything here. So um, chapter seven, again, revolves around flexibility. All right, and you can find this in week two under the week two PowerPoints. All right, so um, as far as the objectives go, basically what we're going to be talking about is how imbalance affects, ultimately it affects how we move. So how do we change the structure so that we make it so it feels better? Okay, so ultimately what is flexibility? <clears throat> it's the, if we look right here at this component right here, the ability to move a joint through its complete range of motion. That's really what we're talking about. Um, if you're able to take and push through and go beyond your normal range of motion, that will set you up to then take the soft tissue and allow it to become more, as they say, extensible. Okay, so those are the words that we really want to pay attention to there. Um, also, they talk down here on the bottom about neuromuscular efficiency. Basically, what we're doing in flexibility is we're able to take the neuromuscular efficiency, the ability of the nerves to send signals to the muscles and use them appropriately so that we are properly extended, again, back to extensibility, and by being properly extended, we can have proper <clears throat> abilities to produce force, reduce force, and then dynamic stabilize, okay? Producing force is what we wanna do to move, okay? Reducing force, that's deceleration, and whether you're a elderly person, a regular person, an athlete, everybody has to decelerate. It's something as simple as just being able to walk up and down slopes, and then on the other side of that slope, being able to control your body down. Well, with proper improper flexibility, you end up with a, um, a, a more difficult time, and your muscles do not want to act accordingly. So... And like I said, it's dynamic stabil uh, stabilization in all three planes of motion. So again, planes of motion, sagittal, frontal, and transverse. Okay. They give a really good example here of all three of those planes of motion. What we're talking about here is the latissimus dorsi and the sagittal plane. So that's forward and backward motions, and that's shoulder flexion. Flexion. Okay. At that point there, we're allowed to raise the arm forward by using the lat accordingly. Okay. In the frontal plane, we're able to do shoulder ABD, abduction, okay, and that's shoulders being able to lift it out to the side. And then lastly, you can use the transverse plane of motion, which is shoulder internal rotation, okay. So that right there are the three planes of motion just for the latissimus dorsi, and if you don't know which one that is, that is your technically your wings or the, the large back musculature. Um, if you look, I believe it's in week three or week four muscle groups, you can see where it runs through, but this is just an example of the lats, okay? And that's a very big motion for um, pull-ups in its own right, okay? So um, what ends up happening, though, is that over the course of time, we end up with what we call postural distortion patterns. And postural dis distortion patterns, if something is distorted, it's not in proper alignment, so we have a misalignment that's going on, and what we need to do is we need to be able to get our flexibility to come back so that we can change those functional movement patterns. And basically, I love this quote here, but try to find the path of least resistance, okay? And by changing that path of least resistance, that allows the muscle to work effectively, and it does not allow for that distortion to occur. Okay, so that's what postural distortions are all about. Distortions are being able to just be able to, you know, move in balance, which we do not want. Okay. Um, as far as flexibility training goes, um, it is a, like it says, multifaceted approach. Okay, there's different ways that you can do this. So not everybody works the same way. Everybody basically has their own way of achieving this. Some people love static stretching, you know, which is, you know, kind of like a simple thing like reaching down and touching your toes. Um, some people, some trainers, some coaches love the ability to work with dynamic, and we'll do some of those examples during class. But understand that it's multifaceted, and there's more than one approach that you can do to achieve optimum soft tissue extensibility, okay? And that's what we're ultimately looking for, okay? <clears throat> we know that 
the human movement system has more than one chain. So if what we're saying here is that if there is a misaligned area of that chain, that will ultimately create dysfunction. And at that point there, it can affect, you know, and we talked about this, I think, and it was week one, where if one segment is messed up, we know that the ability of another segment to become messed up becomes that much greater. So we have to maintain ourselves in posture. Okay. Um, this should be HMS because they don't know how to type here. Um, so we know that relative flexibility can be developed. Um, you know, poor flexibility leads to the development of relative flexibility. And when it's relative, that means that it's relative to what's going on. Ultimately, what that means is that it will lead to an imbalance because relative flexibility means it's going to adapt to a poor pattern. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. So we do not want to limit flexibility. We want to maintain it and keep it optimal. This picture came up yesterday right here, this, this picture area right here, that whole area, because we talked about it from this perspective of this right here, when we are tilted in this manner, meaning that if we are on an equilibrium, this line should be straight up and down. But because of this imbalance, this is technically imbalance, this side here, if you follow the arrow where my arrow is going, this arrow right here is ultimately a overstretched muscle, which means that it's going to need to be stretched or needs to be able to improve the flexibility of it. And when this becomes back in balance, while we're also stretching and taking care of this particular muscle group on one side, the imbalance side, because there's always two ways, and what I always tell people is, our body likes to self-preserve itself. Well, this is not self-preservation. This is basically hurting ourselves. So if this side is overly stretched, this side usually is weak. So what we have to do is strengthen this side, but we need to be able to stretch this side. And that's what we talked about the other day. So imbalance occurs because of these four things, which we'll go through in each one. All right. So something that we have is called, you know, altered reciprocal inhibition. Okay, what that means is it's caused by tight agonists. Remember we said tight agonists are prime movers. Okay, and because of that, they inhibit the functional antagonist or the muscle group that works on the opposing fashion. Okay, so this right here inhibits means it turns off the functional antagonist. That's not good. We do not want that. We still want there to be, I know I joke around about the word, but the word tone. Okay, there still needs to be tone to the antagonist. Okay. Um, there's a synergistic dominance, meaning that instead of the prime mover being the main facet of that motion, the synergists or the muscle groups that assist are actually the ones that take over because the prime movers are either weak or they are shut down, meaning inhibited. So that can be a problem. So altered reciprocal inhibition, synergistic dominance, meaning that the assisting groups are taking over, and it says it right in the term. You have an orthokinetic dysfunction. So you have altered forces at the joint resulting in abnormal joint movement and proprioception. Um, arthrokinetic, what, what we're basically saying is that the joint does not move correctly. That's exactly what that means right there. And then lastly, neuromuscular efficiency, meaning that we can have an imbalance because we have improper nerve to muscle signaling and it's not efficient, meaning that we're not coordinating. Okay, so that's ultimately the four ways that, the, that NASM explains, but these are four of really great terms that come up okay um, so with muscle imbalance you know we have these these dysfunctions well how does our body detect um, if you were in um, exercise physiology you, you remember these terms but um, very quickly mechanoreceptors they kind of basically give you um, the muscle gives an idea as to how it feels during certain times so during movement a muscle spindle what is its job it's to detect or sen be sensitive to changes in length and the rate of that length change, okay? So what happens is once the muscles lengthen, the spindles are stretched, meaning that ultimately the muscle feels it internally, okay? So what ends up happening here is when you become more flexible, these muscle spindles are able to let the, st the stretch be felt more without pulling back on it. And we'll talk more about this because there's a way to feel that end range and your, your body basically does a really good job of kicking back to allow you to know that you went too far. The Golgi tendon organs, those are, like it says here, they're located in the musculotendinous junction, meaning that it's basically located where the tendon and the muscle come together. 
what do they detect? They detect tension, okay, and rate of tension change. So not only do they feel the tension on the muscle, they also feel how fast. So if it happens too quickly, these GTOs, okay, as and sometimes you might see it that way, you know, GTO, okay, that right there indicates that these Golgi tendon organs detect tension. And because of that, they will produce a, a sense of, um, well, like it says here, proper stimulation can cause relaxation in an overactive muscle. And that's called autogenic inhibition. Okay, and what we're ultimately doing there, if they are turned on correctly, they will help the muscles that are super overactive to be able to become uh, less tense. And we need to be able to turn these on for stretch as well. So that's why flexibility is important for them. Okay. So in terms of what we call pattern overload, this is where imbalance can occur as well. Um, so pattern overload. Now, that's a really simple term, but what does it mean? Consistently repeating the same pattern or motion over and over again. Um, let's use this example right here. Um, okay, take that example right there. Or, um, okay, take those two, a construction worker who's constantly hitting a hammer all day long, a garbage worker who's constantly bending and twisting. Who constant, well, I can't even do it right, constantly is bending and twisting. So these two people are going to have pattern overload. If you swing a hammer all day with your right hand, eventually you're going to have too much pattern overload, and that can cause damage to that person's elbow. It can cause damage to the shoulder, the wrist, etc. Garbage worker, same thing. They can end up with lower back pain because of all that bending and twisting. So what does that mean? If they don't take care of themselves correctly, then what's going to end up happening is you have pattern overload, and then that leads to this right here. And this is the cumulative injury cycle. What happens is you end up with something that hurts, okay? At that point there, the tissue is damaged. That leads to inflammation, which we all know, which no one likes feeling. Okay, from that inflammation, if it keeps going through, you end up with these involuntary spasms of the muscles, which then lead to adhesions on the muscle itself. So these muscles are now spasming because of the damage that's been done. So damage, inflammation that comes from it, spasming that occurs from it, adhesions for the healing of that process, but what happens is those adhesions don't ever really go away because it's injured, so you have to take care of it. You end up with altered neuromuscular control, meaning that you're gonna move incorrectly, which then leads to bad movement patterns, so you end up with muscle imbalance, and then it starts all over again at a different area. So again, if it was at the knee, then you could start, you know, the, the, the musculature and the joint areas that are affected are gonna now affect the hip and go through this process. And then again, come back around. Now you have bad movement pattern again in this muscular imbalance. Now you're at the lower back, same thing. Next thing you know, it's up by the neck, same thing. It's a vicious cycle that can never be turned off unless you do your job of flexibility. Okay. So ultimately, there are different formats that we can use. Um, you know, systematic progression is a great term that NASM uses all the time. But you have corrective flexibility, active flexibility. Oops. That wasn't good, right? Yeah, corrective ex corrective flexibility, active, and then functional, okay? Um, each one of them has their own different way. Um, corrective flexibility can be used all the time. Active flexibility can be used, you know, pretty much all the time as well. And then functional also in the same way. It's just they have different ways of doing it. And basically, you can read all these right here, but I'm going to switch to the next one. Because ultimately, corrective flexibility, you're talking about self myofascial release, which is foam rolling, using lacrosse balls, tennis balls. We'll show you all those during class. And corrective is also static stretching. Okay, we'll talk about the differences in those, but static stretching is stable stretching. You're not moving, you're not putting yourself in motion. Okay, um, active flexibility, again, self myofascial release. We talked about that a little bit before. And then active isolated stretching. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit here, but I wanted to move on to um, uh, uh, functional flexibility, which is my favorite of the th of the three that were, are listed, or four that are listed here. But 
Functional flexibility is, again, self-myofascial release, which we talked about, foam rolling, etc., but dynamic stretching. And, that, and dynamic stretching is basically a way to take a static stretch and put motion involved in it to be a little bit more proactive with that, okay? Um, so uh, with um, active isolated stretching, what we're talking about here is there are different ways that we can do, um, you know, there's different ways that we can ultimately allow um, ourselves to be isolated, meaning trying to isolate different muscle groups and to also be active in that process, okay? Um, hold on one second here. Yep, so, and, and basically what we're doing here is we're taking static stretching and dynamic stretching and putting it as an in-between. So what you can do is if you got into yourself into, you know, a, a simple position like, um, um, a plank position and you were to raise one leg up and then come back down, raise the other leg up, come back down. You're isolating specific areas of the shoulder and the abs and then you're using range of motion to be able to um, range of motion of a specific area that you're trying to stretch. Well, that's going to get your hamstrings, it's going to get your lower back, and get your glutes. So that's there. And like I said, we're going to go through all four of these during class time today. So uh, that'll be very important for us to kind of pay attention to. All right. Um, self myofascial release again. What are we looking for? Trying to break down that fascia or the surrounding area of the muscles. Okay. What we do is now it says gentle pressure applied, like a foam roller. It varies, and I and I hesitate when I say it varies, and it depends because you can apply greater pressure, but as a beginner person, you do not want to overextend that. As you become a, a, a more flexible person, as you become more used to these self myofascial release techniques, it will help you to be able to drive a little bit harder into those areas because you have to break down fibers a little bit deeper or adhesions that are on the fibers a little bit deeper. Okay. Um, so basically what will happen is you can use this at any point. I use it um, with my people. I use it at the beginning of a training session and at the end of a training session. And no matter if they're a beginner or an experienced person, I always do because it's <clears throat> very important to keep uh, – it actually helps with keeping fluid moving. Um, it doesn't allow, you know, it helps with the removal of lactic acid, etc. Okay. Uh, static stretching, we know. Now, here's the thing: they talk about hold between 20 and 30 seconds, you know, to an end range. This again varies by person. As someone gets really good, you can have them hold maximal 30 seconds. I don't usually, you know, for a beginner, I don't usually want them going any higher than 30. Um, we do certain things during class that allow us to hold for, you know, two or three minute end ranges, and that's okay, but again, they have to work up to that, okay? So what do they do? They stimulate the Golgi tendon organs, so they feel that tension, and then they produce an inhibitory effect on the muscle spindle. Inhibitory meaning they turn off the muscle spindle. The mu muscle spindle is feeling that stretch, but they're turning it off, meaning they're inhibiting it, so they're not allowing it to occur so that it can go beyond its normal range, and the muscle spindles are like, I'm okay with this. Okay, so active isolated stretching, here we go again, using your agonist and synergist to move a joint, okay, and so what that does, it creates reciprocal inhibition of the functional antagonist, so what we're doing is we're turning off, um, we're, we're the ability to turn off those functional antagonists so that they can be able to uh, let the muscle group move the range of motion without being able to shut it down, okay, and like I said, it allows for a greater range of motion, um, and so basically what you can do is stretch, release, stretch, release, and you know, you do that for you know five to ten reps and you hold for one to two seconds at a time. Okay. Dynamic again, going through a full range of motion, but you're using momentum of the body. Uh, walking lunges are a really good example of that. Um, this is what I like to use pre-stretch because I've seen a lot of research that shows that um, you know, with dynamic stretching, you have the ability to still go beyond range of motion, you know, and still be able to feel the stretch, but you're going to be more specific to the exercise. And I like this to, and, and like I said, because the research shows that dynamic stretching can produce more of an appropriate stretching mechanism versus, um, basically versus a uh, static stretch, which is that reach down and hold or reach across and hold or whatever the holding is. 
So <clears throat> if I were to tell you pre-exercise, and we'll go over this in class again, but with pre-exercise, I enjoy dynamic stretching and self-myofascial release. For post, I like self-myofascial release and static stretching. Um, active, isolated, you can put um, in uh, pre-workout as well You know, with self-myofascial release because it allows for the individual to really, really, really kind of, you know, slow down and make these range of motion changes with the active isolated, okay? So the summary is here, but basically what will happen is you end up with this functional and this active flexibility that will get put into your warm-up and cool-down sections for your, um, for your exercise programming, and it should be listed what you want them to do. So as we go through each one of these concepts, like it says here, you know, flexibility training concepts, what you need to realize is that you need to be able to start implementing these into your training program because you want to eventually create your own. And we're going to start creating our own probably next week or in the week after to get us a better idea. Okay, So that's flexibility. Um, this is a way for us to really dive in deep. So if you're listening to this you know, broadcast or whatever you want to call it, just know that you can, you know, it's a video, you can stop it, rewind it, listen to what I say, and then you can ask questions from there. And, you know, it makes it a little bit better than having to just read this slide by itself. What is flexibility? And then you're reading through. Well, if you are reading through it and you hear my voice with it, it, it may help you to understand it a little bit better. So that's why I'm going to be doing these, video, um, these videos for each one, okay? So have a great day and we will see you soon.